So, where at are we now? So I created um, a bit of background, um, mostly, <coughs> mostly plants and some rocks. Very simple shape. So yeah, usually for for rocks and for anything that is for all sorts of designs in general, what I like to do is to create a base element, a base shape, like a base rock, a base. A blade of grass and just use that element and try to deform it in various ways so it brings enough chaos and diversity so the, uh, the background element still looks interesting but in the meantime by, by doing this it, it allows me to create a common base form language that gives some some sort of unity to the element so because the the rocks in the background, they are all uh, the same base shape. You see, it, it brings that kind of uh, uniformity. And same thing for the strand of grass. So I try to play with the light and shadow patterns to organize my strands, my blade of grass in the background. So they, they will flow uh, along with the composition. So here I created a shadow pattern in the background. So this way I could have this uh, umbrella to uh, to detach against this background. So maybe I don't know I could have like some dark greens. And what what is going to happen because this is grass? Even though it's going to be uh, a blown up version of a grass, so it's going to be like very thick. It's, we're still going to have some subsurface scattering uh, occurring in this material. So I already have this idea that this would be a shadow, but, but with some subsurface scattering. So a lot of saturation and some interesting dark, uh, dark greens. Maybe this umbrella could be a red, I don't know. I have or just a white umbrella, I don't know. I'll have to try that later in the composition. Here I wanted this strand of grass to be in the opposite direction. So the, the flow following the same curve, but it's, they still have like this break in the, in the uh, diagonal direction. So this one are flowing in, in this direction, but still uh, accelerating this curve right here that follows the curve of the of the boat and this one in the background they flow in the opposite uh, diagonal but they still follow a bit of a curve right so uh, I wanted like yes to to frame to vignette the image at the structural level here it's it's a bit more of a cow in the background I wanted things to, to become like a bit more chaotic in here. We almost have like this, this verticals in here. I took care for these rocks to organize in a way that would, that would not create too much tangency with the, uh, with the boat. So this one disappeared behind the boat and yeah, the, the shape come out again. Uh, same here for the foot of the main character. So I, I'm I took care to really organize my blade in the background so they will they would not come too close to the to the uh, coat but still help to detach the foot in the background. So yeah this these are like small thoughts I always have when I this is why I, I always emphasize the fact that I'm I'm more painting with 3D than really thinking it as a 3D scene in itself because I, I really focus on uh, on the 2D projections of each element, and I can't have like I don't try to have like a perfect control on every element because at the end because I'm going to paint a lot, like for example here there is a tangent between this edge of this blade and the light pattern on the character, which which is not. Uh, something I, I, I will 
keep icing. So I will have to repaint this, maybe to have the edge to flow more in the middle of the forearm, just to avoid the tangency. Because when there is like tangency in a tangent, I don't know if the word is tangency or tangent, maybe tangent. When there is a graphical tangent, it, it tends to create a, what we call a graphical node, which is at the abstract level, a high density of details that, that flow toward the same point. So here, this shape of the, um, of the light pattern on the arm and this shape in the background. It creates a center of interest which is not desirable at this, at this place, so I have to fix that. And uh, I also try to keep in mind that I will organize my values using local colors and using um, uh, atmospheric perspective to really help detach all of the elements I had in the first place. So I will really make sure that this silhouette all read properly, uh, but only when I, I will do that only when I, I will be in Photoshop because it's it's easier to fix. I don't want to to um, lose time to uh, try to uh, fix my materials right now. So I really love the idea to use this 50% gray uh, diffuse material to think about the structure of the composition. So I really think in terms of shadow, light, edges, shapes. But this is only a structure. I mean, everything at the composition level will really start to make sense in Photoshop when I will really work on, uh, on values and colors. Um, I think right now I have all of the, uh, all of the elements of the, of the composition. So what I will do right now is ready to go into detailing mode. So uh, I will spend a bit of time to bring just the amount of details uh, I need in 3D. And I will try to really keep in mind that I can do a lot in 2D later. So it's really a matter of, of really deciding, um, okay, is these details really matters in 3D or can I can I fix it in 2D later? Uh, some details are really interesting to add to add in 3D. They they, they really makes me gain a lot of time. So it's it's a it's a fine line to find. <clears throat> between uh, 2D and 3D, and it's mostly a matter of knowing where I am the most efficient and, and what do I enjoy the most. So there is, there is only so far where I enjoy adding details in 3D, and at some point, at some point it starts to become uh, boring and, uh, and frustrating. So when I reach that, that point where I start to, to not enjoy uh, adding details in 3D, 3D I, I try to move uh, in Photoshop. Um, yeah, so uh, I I uh, flattened the uh, the water a bit, and I, I started to uh, just add some rocks and change the depth of the uh, of the ground under the, the water plane because the way key shot react to the liquid materials, it's, it's really a fantastic material in, uh, in Keyshot. It, it renders quite, quite fast, I, I believe, compared to, to other shaders in, a, in other rendering engine. And, uh, and still, you can really figure out some sort of realistic uh, lighting effects and uh, when, when the depths become very, become very thin, we have like lighter values, less saturated, that move towards the, the color of the light. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> here in the shadow of the tone, we have like this deep blue, very saturated um, colors and values. And I, it, it's just a base, but I, I, like, I like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. So I'm going to um, use this as, as base. And maybe I'll do also some uh, some translucent material rendering pass on the grass in the background just to have a, a base for translucency and things like that. Oh, 
Okay, so now I'm going to move into into the detailing stage. Um, well, it's not it's not a tutorial about about ZBrush, but uh, <coughs> you've seen me using for the grace two different type of approach. I I've been using fiber mesh for the for the broad general uh, blade grace just to fill the background. And in the foreground, when I wanted to be really able to organize uh, my shapes in a specific direction for composition purposes, I've been using a, a sphere that I sculpted just to have a, one strand of a, of, of a grass, one blade of grass that I could really uh, move in space with a move brush the direction I wanted. But it's all very, very basic uh, ZBrush stuff. I, I'm not a good um, ZBrush sculptor, and and I try to only use like the very basic features to uh, to tell to tell my story. So I don't want to get caught into like too specific um, detailing techniques and tricks. So I believe uh, any of the of the uh, technique I've used right now in ZBrush, you can use it in any. 3D software. If you if you are more of a blender or Modo user, uh, I, I don't think there is any sp specific feature I used in ZBrush that you can't reproduce in a, in another 3D package. Okay, so maybe I'll start by the by the frog, and just for the sake of efficiency and material splitting. I think I'm going to split the part of the frog we don't see in the camera to make sure I'm not adding uh, details where I don't need them. And maybe also, also I'm going to uh, split the, um, the eyes. Separate them to, to have them as a separate mesh, so I can I can um, manage the proper level of details if I if I need to um, to subdivide and I will need to subdivide to add more details. So I just did a selection in the center and now I, I'm blurring. I'm basically blurring and uh, sharpening the mask to try to select only the eye. A bit of blur, sharpen. Okay, now I see that I, I start to blur in the outside ring. So I think I, I have like a, a good selection. So Control W to create a separate polygroup. Right, and now I can just isolate the eyes and split. Before splitting, I, I have to remove my uh, subdivision level. Set to split hidden. Yeah. Okay, so next step, I want to isolate only the part of the frog I will need for detailing purpose, so maybe I'm going to be just a bit, to select a bit wider, just to stay safe, like I'm going to isolate only the front of the, of the toad. Control W, let's see what we have, I'm going to send this, yeah, it's, I think it's fine, like that, so Let's split hidden. Okay, so this way I can really subdivide now only the uh, this part of the of the toad. And to avoid what just happened, I'm going to remove the smoothing and I'll do the, the smoothing by hand. It's going to be easier that way.
And I always try to remember that any kind of, uh, of sculpting mistakes that would be a sculpting mistakes in a conventional 3D workflow because there is like extremely bad topology and um, yeah, over overlapping polygons and so on. Uh, I try to, to keep in mind that for me it's it's three details. Each time I'm making a, a sculpting mistake, it, it helped me to gain a more um, organic feel to the result. Okay, so I'm not going to see these arms. I'm going to ignore ignore that the, the left arm just moving a bit under its belly because I know it's going to be seen. Okay. Let's see. <coughs> bit here. Fine. I try to hit my nine key as often as possible to uh, to force uh, the uh, the save feature when I need it. So now there is like uh, some overlapping mesh occurring, and that's because for some reason it decided to uh, add back. This is a, a bug that happens quite often in, uh, in the brush. When you do Ctrl Z, it, it actually gets back to the state of the mesh before the splitting, so it's a bit annoying. I have again to del delete my lower geometry and remove the hidden part of the geometry. Okay. Fine. So, looking at my ref, trying to decide which type of detail I'm going to add. So, I really like all of this small bump on the toad in here. I think it's really interesting because it could almost look like a wet rock texture. So this is what I would try to go for, to exaggerate this bumping in a rock-like manner and using um, a wet material coat on top of it to suggest that there is obviously some wet on top of the material. Uh, I, I, I added these this, uh, elements in, uh, in my web folder because I thought it, it could be a nice inspiration for some flowers. But right now I'm not sure that uh, any flowers will bring anything in the composition right now, apart from adding too much uh, noise, too much unwanted information. So I have to, to see if I need some or not. But before adding, adding any um, surface details, I'm gonna try first to uh, really work on the, um, on the overall shape. And what I can see, and I think this is something I've been struggling with since the beginning, is that the orientation of the eyes, uh, they don't, don't make sense at all, because right now the, the eyes are oriented towards the, towards the top. And I think I need them. I need to change this, this orientation a bit. So let's see what I can do. OK. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm reconstructing the subdivision level. Here. And this is going to be helpful to send all these elements to the uh, plugin, to the uh, Transpose Master plugin. I'm just making sure I don't have any hidden geometry because it, it creates bugs with the Transpose Master. So I'm control shift clicking in each mesh, each sub tool to make sure I don't have uh, any hidden geometry. And this is something that is annoying. I've been lazy since um, since ZBrush uh, for R7 P1. After that, I never I never updated my my version to P2 and P3. So maybe this is a bug that has been solved in a recent version of, of uh, ZBrush. And I, I know ZBrush for R R8 just uh, went out. But uh, I don't feel I really need any of these new features right now, so I, I, I will wait before updating. Okay, I think it's fine. Back up again. And T pose mesh. And right now my scene is a uh, is very lightweight. It's, it's only three million polygons. Sometimes I, I can go up to 30, 50 million polygons. Hey, and I did well to back up because it just crashed. Sorry, sorry. I think the brush is trying to read the uh, the crashed information from the disk, so it takes a bit of time. But as I did a backup just before trying this, I'm going to load my latest quick save. Should be good. And really trying to have a, um, a bug. Can I say that a bug tolerant workflow, a crash tolerant workflow is extremely important because uh, yeah, this, this, these things happen a lot when you start to work with several uh, softwares. So yeah, software crash, this is, this is it. There's nothing you can do about it. It can come from the hardware. It can come from many, many different things the operating system, so it's it's not always the fault of the software itself. There is a lot of other places where software crashes. So being careful to have a, a workflow that is tolerant to crash is, is quite important. So backup often, try to have like a lot of different versions. Version, where, yeah, versioning is very really helpful. But I'm going to lose my materials by the way, so I have to open my latest version again, save my water materials, I don't want to set it all again, so I'm going to, kill it, to call it like a uh, Karai B and water. Karai and water. I believe it's like that. Save it to library into liquids. Here it is. So now I can send again. Send 
inside my water here. And reset these materials to my, my default, which is diffuse 50% gray. Okay, that's fine. So let's try this again. Maybe this time I'm going to uh, isolate. I think I cleaned my scene. Yeah, I took care to clean my scene because there is like something really annoying in ZBrush is that you can't really remember the state of um, visible and invisible subtools. So if you start to have like too much unwanted subtools and you by mistake you you do just this like uh, click on this icon when it's selected it's going to lose every all the states so you're going to to uh, lose which uh, subtools were enabled and not enabled so I'm going to enable just these two subtools this is all I need Again, transpose master typos mesh. Okay, and now let's try to tweak the these eyes to match a little better my reference. And also, I think the the shape is going to be more more interesting like that. Many people are complaining with the uh, ZBrush Gizmo, but actually I, I really like it. I, I find it's it's like super super intuitive. And I really love this Gizmo. Yeah, it's definitely more more freaky like that. And I have to fix like this uh, this curve here probably, but let's try to do the same on the other side. I always I always found that big eyes creatures that we often use in child uh, shape language character shape language we often use like these big, very big eyes. I always found it was like super creepy. For me, it's, it's very creepy. I mean, because it, it's very difficult to convey an emotion with this kind of eyes. They look like always, for me, it's these eyes looks like uh, eager, converting. A bit um, pervert, I guess. Why this toad is looking at me like that? I mean, what do he want? Uh, looks looks kind of symmetrical, but once again, if it's not perfectly symmetrical, it's going to it's going to help me actually to add some more. Some more organ organic feel to the to this character, so I don't care too much. Okay, let's see. On this project in 2D, what it looks like. There is something strange now. I don't know. Something about this eye here is a bit strange. Maybe maybe it's too small. I don't know. Let's 
try to upsize it a bit. Because sometimes what looks right in the brush doesn't look right at all under a 3D camera. So because I, I'm mostly painting with 3D, uh, I often cheat with the uh, with the, uh, the initial 3D to, to make things really look right in 2D. Trying to decide. I'm sorry if, if you see me do like super weird faces when I'm working. I, I know sometimes I do like this weird, weird expressions. I'm glad I'm working alone so no one can uh, have fun of me except you. Please be kind. Yeah, something I, I noticed in the shape of the of the toad is like this this little ridge on the nose, which looks really I think really nice in the shape of the of the creature. So I, I want to see if, if it's going to look nice on this project and my camera or not, because it might not it might not look good at all. Sometimes it's a matter of really rethinking the, the planes. Sometimes there is like too much curved surfaces, and uh, I really need to really find some planes. Go back into uh, into full uh, sub tool mode. Okay, cool. I still don't manage to get that proper... I think my my uh, my shape really sucks. It's it's absolutely too tall, I think. I, I need to squeeze things just to see if it's going to look better. Because um, the eyes, they are not wide enough. And uh, yeah. I have like a lot of work to do to be able to really bring this uh, toad like feeling that I, I really like in this ref. Right now it looks like super, super funny.
And I'm going to do something also right now because it's going to make my life easier, I believe. So I'm going to insert proper spheres for the eyes. I'm going to duplicate this, hide this one, lower the rays, dead higher geometry, and just insert a proper sphere here. And delete hidden geometry. Okay. So let's see if I can manage to have an eye that looks like an eye. Because it's it's protruding a lot. More something like that in terms of size. eyes definitely more what I'm looking for and now let's see if I can fix this head shape okay so I'm going, I'm going to make a copy make sure I can compile Basically, how oh, could, could I fix that? I'm trying to think out loud to uh, explain what is going on in my mind. Okay, so I'm going to save a morph target. Now I, I will try to flatten this part of the head like a lot and use the uh, morph brush. Brush morph. This is a morph brush? Yeah. To uh, get my initial high shape back. with a lower intensity because right now it's super strong. So I'm carefully bringing back at least this socket position in space just so that I don't I don't want to impact too much of the nose first to see how it look with a, a flattened a flattened version of the, of the face yeah, and now let's bring back a bit of this shape. It's not going to be seen, but sometimes uh, having more uh, more 3D elements that what I'm going to see in the uh, in the 2D projection, it, it helped me to think about the, uh, the shape. So I try to not add details in this area where I don't need them, but at least having them some all making sense can be helpful. I'm 
bringing back a bit of this of this ridge on each side on each side of the of the nose I believe there is like this sort of ridge okay let's see what it looks like it might be better let's see with the ref Yeah, I think right now what I'm fighting is this initial idea I had to make it look a bit like a giant bulldog, which is going against the natural um, shape of the mouth of the frog that tends to, to go down a bit and be flattened on the front. But I think the, the rough version works works far better so I do my best to try to match that instead of this initial idea just to see I asked I stored a morph target anyway so I can I can go back to the initial shape whenever I want thanks to the morph target Ah, yeah, I see. I see also what what doesn't work. I understand. I understand that this nose was way too long. I mean, if I were a very good sculptor, which I'm not, I would have spotted that probably right from the beginning. But now it, it's just for me, yeah, problem solving. Try to identify with my current skill level, what doesn't work, and try to fix it. So the, the bottom of the mouse might be an issue, except that I think it makes sense in a way to have the, uh, the jaw to, to unlock itself on this kind of, uh, of creature to be able to open the mouse much wider that what it would be allowed to if the bone would stay attached. I don't know if it makes sense from uh, an anatomical, a true anatomical perspective, but uh, to be able to open his, its mouth to it, such an extent to uh, have this giant tongue going out. Uh, yeah, I think it needs to, to have a wider opening. And I want to be able to explain this at least for myself. Sometimes I, I, I believe I, I'm I'm trying to mimic the, the expression of some characters, so it might it might look odd. Like I, I try to have these wide eyes. Like the toad. Okay, so what I did here, I tried to select only the uh, bottom part of the lips. Just to see if I can flatten things a bit more. And I really don't care about this this uh, P 
piece of topology being totally out of place because it's going to create some happy accident anyway so I think I will use this let's see me smile because it, it creates a very very super strange and odd face but I think I, I like that kind of like that <clears throat> so I will try to over emphasize the, uh, the jaw here just like it is right now on the on the uh, web brush and three flakes is the bottom part the bottom lip And the, um, the inflate brush is, is quite difficult to, uh, to. It's difficult with inflate brush to create a regular inflation if the bottom topology is not extremely regular, also. So this is why it creates these, these odd bumps, but I'm going to, to use them and just emphasize these bumps. I'm going to do the opposite here. I'm going to inflate, inflate down, smooth a bit. And deflate. I, I said inflate down, but it was deflating. I, I'm deflating by, by uh, holding Alt. And now I'm inflating, inflating back again, just to create a sense of transition in the shape that can suge suggest um, a lips, even though in the ref it doesn't seem to have such a, such a thing. See if I if I move this nose a bit down, just as it is, just like it seemed to be in the in the actual ref. And I try to match the name of my t-shirt scene with the name of my subtool. Okay. This way I can quickly get back to the state I was in, in the case I'm, I'm losing or forgetting to uh, to do a, an auto backup with a quick save backup.
using my move topology brush when I, when I need to access a part of the topology that is very close to something else. I'm using this, uh, this brush, which has an auto-masking by topology feature, so it doesn't uh, impact the, uh, the end before or foot, I should say. The four feet, sorry. Inflate a bit the size of the arm here. Kind of mimic, suggest uh, a more exaggerated human anatomy. Now I don't really know yet what I'm going to do with this, uh, with this left hand because I, I'd like to, to have it play a more important part in the composition but in the meantime I don't want it to be too distracting so right now the shape is super boring and doesn't express anything have to try to uh, make it look more interesting, I guess. No. Let's take my move topology brush, get back to a lower level of details, and maybe try to uh, not know, suggest uh, some knuckles. One, two, three. Try to slowly give it more interesting, more suggestive shape. Try to move this knuckle up to really emphasize a more human-like kind of, a, of hand. Because this is something we often do as human when, when, when you... Well, if something that I think is interesting in a hand is the way each, um, each finger can, can be perceived and broken into, <coughs> into smaller shapes and overlap 
one another in space. And also suggesting maybe more of a spreading of the end. Like if the creature is uh, ready to, to uh, grab something. So right now I, I'm <clears throat> trying to make sense of these knuckles more in 3D space. As I said, just it's it's more for myself at this point because if I need to sculpt this and having it to have an interesting shape, I, st I still want to be myself attracted and feel excited about the shape. So if the shape only makes sense in 2D space and not in 3D, I guess it. For me, it starts to, to become a bit boring. Okay, so right now I'm trying to create a mask. Yeah, to isolate only the, um, only the fingers and maybe try to blow everything up a bit. It's definitely not super exciting right now. I agree. It looks like shit, but I try to fix this. So if it were a more human-like feature, we will have like these landmarks here. So this one might be something just in between a thumb and a finger. And when I need to get a bit more messy, I, I use the clay tube. The clay build up, yeah, it's a bit like the clay tube. I really like this brush, it's cool. So one, two, if it's going to be like more of a thumb, we should actually have the landmark maybe more in here. And uh, maybe another one here. And a little ridge in the inside. As I said, sculpting, me, sculpting mistakes can be my friend, so... I think this one is enough for the emphasized. <laughs> I 
I think one of the main issue I had when I began with this process was to really have a good, um, I guess, a good understanding of where the same curve can relate in, sh in different, uh, with different camera angle and, and, uh, and focal lens. Because right now, I'm focusing on the on the curve of the um, of the kind of sun-like finger right here, the the top curve in the 2D projection. But I have to figure out which stroke I'm going to need in order to paint that curve into the space. So really again, I, I, I'm really more and more right now, I'm really in the idea that I'm painting with, with the brush. So everything I do is ready to either emphasize a curve or, or, or temper it or suggest more, more of, a, of a shape and, and so on. So, yeah. I'm also trying to exaggerate the, the curve on the on the bottom. Okay, let's see that with everything how it looks like. <clears throat> So where the um, stroke laziness here? Where the inflate brush fail to preserve surface details, the uh, standard brush generally does does better because it, it tends to add to the current uh, surface volume instead of dis destroying uh, all the surface details. And there is not much of this stage right now, but I still want to keep as much as I can of these small strokes and accidents that, that should help me to, to bring more of, a, of an organic feel to the result. Yeah. <coughs> I think I'm going to stop to mess around with this one. In a little while, because otherwise I, I start to just spend absolutely too much time on meaningless details. So. Move technology. Move this one a bit up.
right now I, I'm sincerely a bit dubious about what I did because I feel like it, it starts to become difficult to uh, to understand that this is a hand. But it's it's by uh, fixing mistakes that I generally end up having something more interesting. So. Because I have to be careful that this hand doesn't become uh, too much of a center of interest either. So I mean, I, I could go crazy. I create like this long, longer fingers, like with really a more, a more uh, twisted curve and, and ridges with more angles. But uh, I feel it starts to compete with the fish. So. I need to communicate the idea that okay, this is a kind of frog, toad, hand, but I need to keep it uh, like soft enough, quiet enough, so it doesn't create too much interest. <clears throat> Maybe I could add, I don't know, some vegetation, some smaller uh, uh, grassland in front of it. Let's see. And to stop right now, maybe come back to this part. <coughs> Try to suggest more of it. Okay, I need a backup, so I think I'm going to delay it. I only have like um, sub tools I need, so it's going to be once again easier to reactivate all of them, isolate and reactivate only what I need. Okay. Trying to explain this socket. And I always keep in mind my initial idea, which is to to make this toad look a bit monstrous. So, yeah, a bit of a... How can I call that? Okay, so I think I'm I'm more or less good with the other shapes. Maybe I could do something like that. Okay. 
I don't know. I'm just trying to see if it's bringing something interesting or not. It's just like there, like there is like a lot of, uh, of skin underneath. More than one we can see. It's going to be hidden in the bone, in the bone slide anyway. So, but eventually, it could help me to suggest more monstrosity, more kind of disgusting surface details. pinch some of these details just to have them look a bit more natural. Not sure if he's bringing anything but... Um, so now I think I'm going to create a layer, which I really don't do often because sometimes it's really a mess. But um, I want to make sure that anything I'm going to do at, until this point, uh, I, I can go back on it. So let's do this, maybe add another level of, of uh, subdivision. Right on layer. And start to add uh, some of this uh, bump. You can see in the red. So we have like some interesting bump on the on the uh, yes on this part. Sorry, sorry. When I when I'm working, sometimes I just forgot the uh, the English names for things. But see what I mean. Hopefully. Like this razor jumps skin here. Trying from on one side just to see how it looks before doing it here. So what I often do, in fact, and I forgot to do it right now, is instead of having just a flat, a 
um, texture for my base material I'm using an occlusion map so generally I'd like to have like 15 it depends 10 15 of the black and 55 just to compensate for the darker values in some places so I'm going to move on to a flat materials just to set up to uh, parameter my my, uh, my occlusion map but I think right now it's not that bad with a bit more of a fall off to help isolate just the smaller details. Can be cool. Let's go for 10% just to have like slight, slightly darker values in these places. Let's see. It helps. It often helps me to understand what happened in the image. And for more boon slide, I'm going to move more accurate boon slide to a 2.2 gamma. It might not be super obvious the difference, but the, uh, the 2.2 gamma is something I'm used to from. I don't know if it works like that in uh, in key shots, but usually in a linear workflow, if you are a 3D guy, you know why I'm, I'm using this 2.2 gamma. Maybe it doesn't make sense in Keyshot, I don't know internally how it handles light with this uh, uh, sun and sky map. But um, when I want just more uh, of the words, uh, uh, more bones light, I would say. I forgot the technical word, but I, I usually play just with the, uh, with the gamma curve. And, and the local color of the material. So if, if I'm darkening the local color or, or just moving my uh, my breast my breath brightness back, it can help me to get more bones light in the shadows. The resulting image can be slightly less appealing uh, than what we had before because it's a bit less contrasty but it's uh, it's easier in Photoshop later to uh, to isolate some details so the texture map might be a bit too strong Yeah, because I changed the gamma, it's funny because it, it also changed the, uh, the values. So, let's get back to 55. 55, 15, and a gamma of 2.2. So now it's a bit, it's a bit easier to read the details I just, I just added in the shadows area. It's mostly for myself to really see if it makes sense and if it's interesting to add these details. Okay. So now I'm going to use an alpha to add uh, smaller details on the face. to see if it's interesting or not. It could bring like some kind of teeth-like edge uh, on the on the uh, on the lips. So 
maybe you could make it look a bit more freaky, a bit more monster-like. Geometry, I'm at the max for the subdivision. Just change the focal lens to to have more defined lines. The, not the focal lens, the focal shift, sorry. <laughs> I always found these kind of patterns are... Because it's, they, a bit, they look a bit like teeth when you start to add a wrinkles in this direction and they also look a bit like um, these, the uh, fold patterns you can have on really old people maybe stronger and less dense suggestions on the bottom lips. I think I need to exaggerate this really on the bottom part to have an interesting silhouette right now. These bumps, they are seen more in this direction, so they don't really participate in this silhouette. So I want to bring more of this at the, at the silhouette level. Add a bigger bump just on these parts. Ooh. Yeah, this is what I wanted just to, to break the silhouette, this line, and really suggest this idea of this. And um, yeah, it, it starts to come. Start to start to look a bit more alive. Just want to add like a couple very very big bump here on the uh, on the silhouette. So I'm trying to identify where is the, um, the curve I'm seeing in 2D. I think it's this one. I'm to add like a couple bump here. Good job. Okay. A few bump. Maybe a few bump. In here too. Smooth first. Smooth. And then yeah, 
Yeah, this is saddle, but maybe it's a bit, bit too strong here, so I'm going to move down the subdivision level to smooth the big shape and go up again. So now we have like less prominent bump on this part. I don't want it to break too much a silhouette and then start to bring like a high density details which could attract too much the eye outside of the of the socket itself because I I really want these big eyes to to be a, obviously a, a center of, of reading. Okay. So I guess right now I'm I'm almost done with the big uh, big details on this frog. I don't know. Maybe try to suggest a couple couple bump here, but same again. It could it could really start to distract the eyes if I have like too strong bump on the silhouette. So I want to try this and see how it looks like.